Well, hey guys, Natalie here, and welcome back to It's a Good Life. So glad you're here because today we're going on a full garden tour. Well, hey there, if we haven't met yet, my name is Natalie. I'm a modern day homesteader here in San Diego, California. And today, this Christmas week, I thought I would take you on a full garden tour. I have to be honest, I don't do full garden tours very often because I often feel like I don't have much to share or show for myself or that my space might not be that interesting to other people. But I know a lot of you guys wanna see what Jess and Jill planted. And today I'll give you an update on that finally. But you know, it dawned on me this weekend as I was sitting out here in the beautiful morning light that God's creation is out here on full display for me to see because I said yes to a dream. Like all of this was just a vision. It was just a thing in my head, not that long ago. Less than two years ago, we moved here and got the vision for the potager garden. It got the vision for the pollinator gardens. And eventually I built this greenhouse and some hugo culture beds and a worm farm. And slowly but surely this place has evolved into so much more than it was when we first started, which was really just a blank slate. And so many dreams have come to fruition that I think it's important to just stop and sit and to soak in the glory of creation and to soak in a dream coming to fruition. I know many of you are buried under six feet of snow. I know there are many of you who long to have a little bit more space than an apartment patio. And so today I invite you into my space and say welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I've shot this video very intentionally so that it feels like maybe, just maybe for this moment, this garden can feel like yours too. It's raw. It's real, it's unedited. We've got leaves that need raking. We've got things that need pruning. I figured I'd take you along and share with you where we are right here, right now, this Christmas week. So grab your cup of coffee or your cup of tea and join me as we go on a full garden tour today. Now that we've got our coffee or our tea, let's head out to the front garden. This is where we spend each morning in quiet time and letting the cats outside and stretch their legs. And one of my favorite parts of this little area is this string of pearls, probably because this was the first succulent I ever purchased and I killed it multiple times, but now I know how to keep it alive, and that's a beautiful thing. In this front garden is where we also keep our green stock garden, which I continue to be so impressed with and amazed by. This is such a wonderful small space growing solution. And as you can see, we're growing up to 30 plants in one and a half square feet of space, which absolutely blows my mind. And I wish I had known about this sooner. This is also where naughty cats who are trying to escape get locked up. <laughs> this green stock garden is producing so much for us right now. It's more than we even know what to do with sometimes. I love having fresh herbs and fresh greens right outside our kitchen door. I also tried to plant some beans here, but I think my bean seeds were dead. Everything else though is doing really well. In 
this is what I would call our bistro area. Here is where I hung some trellises in hopes to have a lush green wall. But as you can see, it's lacking greenery because, well, you can't really plant bougainvillea in the middle of winter and forget to water it and expect a lush green wall. <laughs> So lesson learned, and these bougainvillea will soon be transferred out for what I think might be a more appropriate solution like nasturtium. But just beyond that, we do have a lush green wall of Confederate star jasmine, which with an application of worm tea, we were able to get a second bloom out of this fall. And just beyond the bistro area, also saved by worm tea is, as many of you know, our Meyer lemon tree. This little tree is over 30 years old. We didn't plant it and it was on the verge of death when we first moved here almost two years ago. But I'm happy to say that in learning to become a worm farmer, I was able to use lots of worm castings and lots of worm tea to yield an abundance of lemons this winter more than I even know what to do with right now. And though she's come a long way, she still has her flaws. She was hit with some really hot temperatures this summer that have left her leaves a little discolored and she's still in need of some pruning, which we'll take care of here in the next few months. But each day I go out and I see all of these lemons, I'm just amazed at what a little TLC can do to yield abundance in a small space. Opposite our Meyer lemon tree is all of our lavender. And beyond the lavender is our passion fruit vine, which for the first time I'm attempting to espalier. Doing so with just a few nails and fishing line. But as you can see, it is loved by local insects, namely the swallowtail butterfly. And to combat this pest, I usually hand pick them or apply some BT spray. Another tree who was in need of some TLC this year was our bear's lime tree, whose roots were nearly completely eaten by the Japanese beetle grubs. To help her recover, I completely removed all of her old soil, replanted her in compost, and added milky spore to the soil to help prevent future outbreaks of the Japanese beetle grubs. And as you can see by all of her blooms, she's officially on the mend. Now let's move on to the backyard gardens where we keep our greenhouse, as many of you know, as well as our potager garden and pollinator gardens. To give you a better idea of how all of this fits together, I thought I would share with you what the view from our back door is. Our garden is essentially a giant L shape with the potager garden on the right hand side, our pollinator garden in the corner of the L, our worm farm also, partially in the corner of the L. Some hugel culture beds, very experimental in containers. And just around the corner is where you'll find the greenhouse. Let's take a look at what's happening in the greenhouse, which by the way, I built myself and I'm still so impressed that it's not only standing, but that it's mobile and something that we can take with us once we've graduated from this small space. Mm -hmm. 
I love that this mobile greenhouse is on wheels and that we can take it with us. And that it's a testament to what can happen if you apply yourself and just give something your best effort. But what's more impressive is that things are actually growing in here, which gets me so excited. I recently started a variety of seeds from flowers to root veg to salad leafy greens. I'm also running an experiment to see what seed starting mix I like best one with just vermiculite or one with perlite. So far, I'm liking the one with vermiculite much better. Some things I'm really excited to see sprouting are this strawberry blonde calendula, because I thought that the seeds may have been ruined when Jess and Jill were out here and we were planting in the rain, <laughs> but very happy to see that they're sprouted. Alongside something new to me, which is these queen velvet sunflowers. Their sprouts are just as beautiful as the sunflowers appear to be. Next, we have the root veg, which may seem odd to start in containers, but if you caught my video with Brigitte of San Diego Seed Company, she starts her root veg in containers and transplants them out with great luck. And so I thought, if she's doing it in a small space, I might give it a go as well and see how it goes for me. So far, I'm really happy with the amount of germination on all of these carrots, radishes, and beets. Some other favorites of mine that have just started sprouting include this Tuscan kale. This Bloomsdale spinach, which does really well in our hot, arid climate here in San Diego. This Rouge de Hiver, I'm not saying that right, I'm sure, but it's a lovely lettuce and one of my favorites to eat. And this Little Gem lettuce, another one of my favorites that I'm so happy to be starting and growing this season. Now, some of you asked, why are your containers diagonal inside of your trays? And to that I say, well, I don't have trays that match my containers. And because of that, I have to make it work with what I've got. And so this is how I make it work. I just rotate them and I actually like the pattern that they make. Next up, we have our Hugel culture containers. Inside each of these containers is compost and a lot of local wood cuttings. They recently chopped down a lot of eucalyptus trees in our area. And after letting the wood dry, I added these to our containers as an experiment to see can Hugel culture really be done in a container. And I'm happy to say that as of right now, it's looking like the answer is yes. We have a lot of things popping up here that are doing really well. These are sunflowers that I saved from my garden last year. Soon it will be time to transplant them and thin these out, but for now, I'm letting them stay where they are. In between our two Hugel culture container beds, I've got this olive tree that I got at Trader Joe's a couple years ago, and it absolutely loves the full sun. This is our second Hugel culture bed. And as you can see, it's not doing as well. And I think that has to do with sunshine. Lack of sunshine has decreased germination and the plants seem to be struggling a little bit. Across the way from our Hugel culture beds is our pollinator garden and also where I keep my worm farm. This bench once belonged to my family, my mother-in-law, and my mom actually 
refurbished it and gave it to us as a gift. And I love having it out here. I think it's such a great romantic touch to this little part of the garden that I've tried to make as romantic and whimsical as possible. Just beyond the bench is our bird bath, a local favorite, which I've made a bit of a statement piece with by adding some pavers to kind of accent this area. And of course, what is a romantic garden without a chandelier from our wedding? which is starting to rest, but I think it adds to the character just a little bit. And all around the birdbath are sage and salvia plants in desperate need of trimming, but can you really trim them when they're in full bloom? This color is one of my favorite colors and I have such a hard time trimming these plants back when they're in bloom, but it will be done nonetheless because it's best for them and best for the garden. But for now, we enjoy their beautiful fuchsia color. And just beyond the pollinator garden is, a, is an oliver, is an oliver cat plant. And some other random things. Many of you have asked why I use chicken wire, and this is why because it allows me to use our fence as vertical gardening. And this is where I grew zucchini rampicante. <laughs> and as you can see, I have yet to pull it off the chicken wire. Just beyond that is our avocado tree, which we actually planted at our wedding. It's underplanted with some sweet potato vine and it had a rough go this summer. It was burnt to a crisp at one point. But after moving it to a better location, applying lots of worm tea and worm castings, it's back looking healthier than ever. We planted this from seed, so we have no idea what kind of avocados it will yield, but here's to hoping. And here's another olive tree, which was actually planted with that original olive tree that I showed you earlier. Because they were competing for space, this one struggled to grow, but it's doing a lot better now in its own container. Now for the potager garden. Just beyond our love fern exists the potager garden, which as many of you know, I built myself with my own two hands on a budget using cedar fence pickets. And as you can see, I promised you a very raw and real tour. Our cucamelon vine, which once overtook this archway, is officially on its way out. Just in the last two weeks, it's completely dried up. The cell walls have exploded, I'm sure, in the 30 degree temperatures at night, and it is struggling. It is struggling. But she was glorious while she was here. And now it's time to say goodbye. Just on the opposite side of this trellis, there is life. Some volunteer nasturtiums have decided that they are back and ready to be trellised, just in time. Many of you asked how I do this, and it's simply something that the plant does at this time of year. It wants to grow upwards, and soon it will be completely covering this, and it will be in competition with this black-eyed Susan. This sign actually belonged in my grandmother's garden and I'm honored to now have it in mine. Okay. 
So in bed number one, we actually still have peppers. Yes, peppers are still growing here, albeit very slowly, but they are growing nonetheless. So I'll be as patient as I can to let these ripen, but then I'll be removing these pepper plants to plant some more fall crops. And in between those pepper plants is basil, whose seeds are ready to be harvested. But perhaps the most glorious plant of all here is this jalapeno plant, which I did not know turned red if you left it on the stem long enough. Are you guys ready to see some Jess and Jill plants? Moving on to bed number two is where Jess and Jill help me plant these little purple bok choys. Some of whom have some pest damage and I will be treating that with diatomaceous earth. We also have quite a few volunteers in this area, like these items from last year. This was one of my favorite lettuces, so I'm happy to see it growing alongside these purple dove bush beans that Jill planted. Moving on from bed number two to bed number three, I have to admit, I think a lot of our seeds may have been eaten by birds or we just didn't plant as many as I think we did. But according to my map, we did not plant many things here. <laughs> Although I can identify that there are some leafy greens growing and that is a beautiful thing. Unfortunately, they did not get labeled in my map that day due to wind and rain, but I'll take them nonetheless. <music> Moving from bed number three, to our 14 foot bed number four. You can also see signs of life, like this Bloomsdale spinach, although it is struggling a bit with the earwigs. And to address this, I will be spraying some diatomaceous earth. And I think these might be French breakfast radishes and some green beauty peas. One of the greatest elements I've had to battle this season are the leaves from my neighbor's tree. And a lot of you have said, leave them, they make great mulch. And others of you have said, you gotta get them out of there because your seeds won't survive. And to all of that, I say, I'm doing my best and we will see what happens with this year of experimentation this season. And moving on to the last bed, We've got lots of things planted here, and I would say that this bed is doing the best. Here we've got lettuce, it's a romaine lettuce. In the middle, we've got turnips, and towards the back, we've got beets. I wish I had written down the exact varieties, you guys, but it was so windy and rainy that day, I didn't get the exact varieties down. So I'll have to keep you posted on that. But for now, I hope that you guys are having a wonderful Christmas week and thank you for joining me on this garden tour. Wherever you may find yourself, I hope you're making the most of it, daring to dream the big dreams and taking time to soak in all the little victories along the way. Thanks for joining me today, you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. <music>